Yes, good morning. Today we're about to talk about a subject that's very close to my heart as a, as a practicing doctor and psychiatrist. An ever-growing number of people are being treated for mental illness. We know that for a fact. And a lot of us blame that on the modern world. But critics warn that psychiatrists, possibly in cahoots with Big Pharma, have got an interest in describing normal, perhaps even fundamental aspects of human behaviour as an illness or a condition or a disorder. Perhaps it'd be better to give up that whole idea, throw it out altogether, or we're doing that consign the very, very sick to a life of misery. I think it's fair to say we have three of the country's top experts on the very subject. On my right is Professor Richard Bentle. Two of his books, which are, you could say are against the, the, the argument of psychiatry, are really quite thought-changing and made a serious contribution to the psychiatric debate. On my far left is Lucy Johnston. Lucy, for many years, has been working on alternative frameworks that look far more importantly at the psychological, the social and the power balances that go on between people when they become mentally disordered. Our third speaker today is uh, the, the only MBBS-wielding doctor on the panel. And John, you were a GP for seven or eight years working in the frontline clinical practice but you became quite interested in the obviousness of psychological and social factors in illness. So, let's let battle commence. Is the modern world making us ill, or are we medicalising normality? Richard, can we start with you? From the moment you wake up in the morning to the point when you go to sleep at night, and possibly beyond because sleep affects your mental health, you are swimming in the causes of mental health and ill health. In terms of your relationships with other people, the social and economic environment you live in, and so on. And these are very powerful determinants of mental health. And we shouldn't think of mental health as either having a mental illness or not. We should think of continua between mental health and mental illness. And those social factors knock you along or back and forth along the continuum. So where we draw the line between health and illness is to some extent arbitrary. Although we shouldn't, that shouldn't worry us all that much because that's true of a lot of physical illnesses like hypertension as well. But what we should be wary of is seeing these phenomena as largely medical phenomena which require medical intervention rather than responses to a world which is challenging and difficult to live in and difficult to navigate our way through. And we should think about how we can change the world in order to make it that we are lower down that continuum more towards the, the side of healthy functioning and able to live our lives you know, in a fulfilling way. Thank you. Lucy. OK, I think the problem is that this is going to be less of a battle than a love-in, as we were saying <laughs> earlier, because actually we come from rather similar positions. But, I mean, just to expand a bit on what Richard has said, which I do agree with, there's quite a lot of evidence that something about modern Western industrialised societies is making us more, and I wouldn't use the word mental illness, is making us more miserable and unhappy in a way that expresses itself in all sorts of different ways. And, of course, people have always been mad or distressed, but, you know, we haven't always had this rising epidemic of what I would not call mental illness. And part of this, I think, along with a genuine in increase in distress, it's also a process of us being encouraged to medicalise things that certainly would be seen as normal aspects of everyday life, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. We could all think of examples of that. But essentially, I think we're living in an increasing individualistic and materialistic and competitive and fragmented society. And that is not good for all of us, for any of us. It's not healthy for any of us. Where I would differ a bit from Richard is I'm very picky about language. I would not call this mental illness. We're not dealing with people, patients with illnesses, but people with problems. People who at some level are responding in an understandable way to a huge range of social pressures and relationship difficulties and social norms and expectations which have really become almost crippling for many of us. And actually, despite all the well-meaning anti-stiba campaigns and so on, and there's something to support there, we are not going to tackle this so-called epidemic of so-called mental illness until we really make an effort to live in a just, a fair, a more equal society. And what's your take? So the world I work in is bringing together the, the biological reasons, the social reasons, and the psychological reasons. So I think on that front, even though I'm medical, we're very much on a similar page. But I guess it's about why do we feel like there might be an epidemic? They do big surveys, and these big surveys fight, can, can say who has an actual diagnosis, who meets the threshold for anxiety and depression. There has been a slight increase in anxiety and depression, but it's not huge. And it's mainly in older adolescent girls. But what has changed dramatically 
the people is about people knowing that they're unwell. So it used to be that you might meet the criteria for anxiety and depression, but you wouldn't know it. So if someone said, are you depressed? You'd go, no, and you wouldn't seek help. What's happening now is that people are much more aware when they might be hitting those thresholds. And, and when they hit those thresholds, they're more likely to seek help. Still, the people who hit those thresholds, there's only less than half of people with diagnosable common mental disorders ask for help. But our mental health systems are chronically underfunded and have been for years, and we can't meet that growing awareness. And I think that gives people a sense of an ep epidemic. The modern life has changed. So the areas that I do research in particularly are young people's mental health and suicide and self-harm prevention. And so I always get asked about social media, about individuals, about how rapidly our world is changing. Change brings discomfort, brings sometimes a sense of moral panic. I noticed that Anne used the terms threshold for anxiety and depression as though they were things. We obviously warned about the dangers of language. But what I'd like to do then is come down to another word, biological. Is all illness biological? mental illness or physical illness come to that? I think both physical and uh, mental illness are hugely impacted by people's social circumstances. So I come from a public health background. I think poverty plays a huge impact. Certainly people who have, um, who, who would think of themselves or services might think of them as having mental illness, they definitely experience um, what we might term biological symptoms. They feel unwell. Um, however, to change people's social circumstances often requires political will. I think that's why sometimes we focus very much on, on the medical model because that's something that people can do something about. Whereas some of these broader social aspects are much more complicated to impact. You may have biological predispositions, but social causation. I come from public health and primary care. I think, you know, substance misuse, poverty, those are the things that have a real impact on people's mental health. Richard, what's your take on that? So to, to answer the question, yes, it's biological because everything's biological. Every time you think something happens in your brain. And one of the things which has changed in my career is our ability to it, to see those things because we have neuroimaging techniques. If you look at the brains of people who are diagnosed with psychiatric disorder, it's definitive. The brains are functioning in a different way. There's no question about that. It's complicated because there's different ways for different types of problems and so on. The problem is how we think about that. The temptation has always been to say, well, you know, we've got something funny going on in the brain scanner. That means it's a biological illness. It doesn't mean anything of the sort. What we also know is that life experience changes the way the brain functions. I think, to, without a shadow of a doubt, that childhood abuse is causal, uh, it's a big word cause, but I'm prepared to use it in this circumstances, is causal in adult psychiatric disorders. And it plays a role in the type of most severe disorders which I'm interested in, which would call the psychosis. I don't think there's any question about that. We also know from brain scanning studies that children who are sexually abused, that their brains develop in subtly different ways. So, for example, the hippocampus, which is a near region in the center of the brain, tends to be smaller. And what's going on is the brain is responding to events in the world. And so wh where do we say is the cause of the mental illness? I'd say it's the events in the world, and the brain is a kind of what we'd say is a mediator. It's just kind of what's, what's part of the pathway. You want to say something here? So I think the only difficulty I have with that, so I think what you're saying is completely right. So that sort of childhood trauma, whether it's abuse or neglect, mm -hmm. um, has a huge impact. But, but the one thing that we do know is that one risk factor plus another does not equal illness. Okay. So, so, so I think that's where I move slightly away from causal. Right, so, so here you are but saying category. Need, uh, but then we need a different understanding of what we mean by cause in what I wouldn't call mental illness. Because Can you help us there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Because obviously it's not the case that tragically this person was sexually abused, they're going to end up with something that we might call schizophrenia 20 years down the line. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today.
to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.